Welcome back everyone. We're going to wrap up Unit 3 and the semester with even more safety issues of fishing. Remember, whenever we cover these safety issues, I, I do not mean to scare anyone into not fishing and taking up bowling, but rather, FYI, you know, knowledge is power. And the more you know about these things, the better decisions you're going to be able to make, and ultimately, the this this uh, safer and more healthy you will be, uh, and others uh, around you. So today we're going to talk about boating. Boating changed just about a century ago, uh, the early 1900s we transitioned from sailboats to powerboats. And at first, it was a very good, even transition. Powerboats became more popular. They were extensions of commercial vessels at the time uh, until really right after the First World War, um, the 1920s they started to add steering wheels to boats. In fact, they were actually called wheeled boats because of that steering wheel. And that took the connotation of boat operation out of the seafaring realm and transferred it to the automobile driving realm. And so today, most powerboats, in fact, probably 99% of all powerboats, have steering wheels. Yeah, there's actually other ways that you can control a powerboat other than a steering wheel. But that's what we have now. And there's this idea that if I know how to drive a car, I know how to drive a boat where a lot of that is true, there are certain aspects of boat operation that are totally foreign to vehicle operation. In 19, or 2018, uh, Coast, Coast Guard stats, uh, we lost about 633 people uh, in, in boating accidents. That uh, was greater than 4,000. Huge property losses associated with this. Of those people who who, who perished, uh, about 77% of them died. I would guess that the rest of them um, probably suffered uh, blunt force trauma and lacerations. There's a surprising number of people who get caught up in boat propellers, which would not be an easy way to go. If I have the stomach for it at the end of this, I will tell you a very gruesome story uh, about a local accident that we had that uh, was just horribly, horribly tragic. So of those drowning deaths, about 84% of them were not wearing a life, ja life jacket or a personal flotation device. Other stats that I have seen, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, that number uh, shoots up to about 90%, uh, 93% in a couple cases. The, the, the general idea is that when you put that PFD on, there's only about a 10% chance that you're going to die. We'll get into PFD usage here in just a few minutes. Uh, alcohol is something that most people don't realize how the effects change whenever you're on the water. You might be able to grab a, uh, a six-pack of your favorite swill, <clears throat> pop four of them down, not even feel a thing. If you're out on a boat down in Allen's uh, Creek on Lake Monroe, having a good time taking a plunge every now and then because it's, you know, so so hot. You down one to two beers and you are most definitely feeling 
you know, feeling the effects of the alcohol. Between wave action and heat and sun exposure, the effects of drugs and alcohol are amplified. And one of the side effects of alcohol and, and consumption is impaired judgment. So things that you would never even consider doing sober suddenly becomes a good idea. <clears throat> you know what the uh, uh, you know what the last words of a redneck were. <laughs> Here, hold my beer. <laughs> um, so be very cognizant of this. Um, alcohol is involved in, uh, in, in about 20% of, of all deaths. I think that that number is probably actually uh, higher. Uh, also remember that when you're on the water and you're operating a motorboat, you are under the same laws as if you were on the highway operating a vehicle. The uh, conservation officer, uh, DNR, uh, uh, law enforcement, uh, can pull you over to the shoreline and write you a citation for operating a motor vehicle while under the influence. And it carries the same full effect of, of, the, uh, uh, of the law. Uh, there's, there's no difference between the highway and the, uh, the, the, the waterway. So remember that. Here's another thing that has caught up some people. If you're down at Allen's Creek, you know, partying away, and the boat is not running, the engines are shut down, you're sitting there in the, the helm seat, you know, where the steering wheel is, drinking a beer, and the keys are in the ignition. And the CO comes by and sees this, you're going to be cited for operating a vehicle while under the influence because the keys were in the ignition. That's Even though the engine was not running, you'll probably be cited for a violation. So remember that. Whenever you shut the engine down, take out the keys. I mean, secure everything. Um, again, designate a driver. I mean, keep at least one person, you know, with their wits about them. Um, uh, we've always saved the beer for, for, for after after the uh, the day at the lake, um, I've I've just never thought it was a good idea to mix uh, alcohol and large bodies of water. Bad things have happened, such as parking your ski boat inside a cabin cruiser. This is frowned on in all boating communities. Just not a good idea for either party. This gets into education. About 74% of all deaths uh, occurred where the boat operator did not receive any boat, uh, uh, boat operation instruction. To get your driver's license, you have to study for the test. You have to take the, 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 the test. You get your learner's permit. You have to practice, what is it, 40, 50 hours, something like that. Uh, demonstrate parallel parking uh, skills during your driving test, and then you are awarded your, your driver's license. Uh, and we have it easy. Some countries, it's much, much, much harder to get a, a driver's license than it is in the U.S., for most areas, you can buy a boat and take it out on the water and nobody says a word. There's a real push to increase boater education. It's not the same as driving a car down the road. There's, there's tons of nuances involved and... <clears throat> That's a little bit beyond the scope of this class, um, but I think the the biggest thing I can encourage you to do is if you're operating a 
uh, a boat, uh, and this includes personal watercraft, jet skis, uh, to, to, to learn how to do this, to get some, some education. Um, it, it looks like about 18% of deaths occurred where the operator had received some type of safe boating um, uh, education. In Indiana, you can go to the website um, BoatTech, uh, ed.com Indiana. This is a, a very large website. It actually covers all 50 states. You can go and take a, an online class on safe boat operation. And this is going to cover everything. Um, it's very heavy on rules of the road, safe navigation, the actual boat operation, uh, safety procedures for fueling and and defueling and and how to navigate congested areas, so on and so forth. It's um, free. You just need to, to to sign in and and watch a series of videos and and take uh, 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 you know little quiz quizzes between each videos and then at the end there's a a test that you can take. If you pay them, I think it was thirty five bucks the last time I looked at it, and you pass the test, you can print out a certificate, and that certificate can be turned into your insurance company and most insurance companies will give you a uh, a discount on your your boat uh, boaters insurance very 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 well worth it i mean <clears throat> if you're sitting at home bored this might be something to to take advantage of Don't think just because you're in a great big, um, you know, 19-foot bass boat that you're immune to to accidents. Uh, that only happens in the in the, with the big ski boats. Um, no, actually, most drowning, uh, most boating fatalities occur in boats under 21 feet. Yeah, I know. There's a whole bunch of ski boats, uh, uh, power boats that are under 21 feet. But canoes and kayaks are, are not totally uh, immune from this. If you're paddling a canoe, you amount to only about 7% of the total boat fatalities. If you're paddling a kayak, it's about double that. Not surprising. Oh, did you? I'm sorry. Shouldn't have said that. Um... No, I like kayaks. I, I really do like kayaks. And I also like canoes. Um, if you're in a uh, open power boat, uh, it jumps up to about 50%. So that's where we get into the uh, uh, speed. And uh, let's be honest, it's, it's kind of hard to, not impossible, but kind of hard to get in trouble in a, in a canoe or a kayak. In a uh, powerboat, things can go from from great to horrible in in literally just a, a matter of, of seconds. Uh, of of powerboats, um, personal watercraft actually aren't as bad as what a lot of people think they are. Um, cabin cruisers are really very good. I mean, about fifteen fifteen percent. Uh, it's the open motor boats that are really leading the statistics as far as, as boating uh, accidents. Uh, power boating has been struggling in recent years. Uh, to be honest, it's been struggling for decades. The, uh, the 90s saw a real huge increase in, in uh, uh, power boat use uh, boaters. Very, very good for the, the industry. There were some uh, government legislations that, that kind of put a crimp on things for a while. You, you finance majors may want to uh, investigate that. But overall, for about the last 10 years or so, the, the, the uh, boating community has been trying to get more people out on the water. So if you are of that, that ilk... 
consider it. Uh, you'll be out of uh, school soon, and it's a wonderful pastime as long as you're doing it safely. Okay, let's uh, jump into uh, personal flotation devices. <clears throat> I hope to do a, a little uh, video demo uh, for you because typically what happens whenever your buddy in, invites you to go fishing with them, you meet at the, uh, at the marina, and you park your vehicle, you grab your, your, you know, your rods, your tackle boxes, maybe a, a cooler with some snacks and beverages in it, and you load it onto his boat, you, you launch the boat, and away you go. Never really a mention of life jackets. Now, the, according to Coast Guard regulations, there's a whole series of safety equipment that each boat is required to have. And this includes everything from canoes, small kayaks, all the way up to, you know, 100-foot luxury yachts. The larger the vessel, the more safety equipment is required to have. At best, most people will say something like, oh, by the way, the life jackets are stowed in that locker over there. And that's it. If life jackets are not worn, they're next to useless. And we've gotten away from using the term life jacket because there was a ambitious young lawyer one time who sued the industry for the term life preserver. And he argued that the life preserver didn't actually preserve life because people could die while wearing one. And you know, syntax, through syntax, technically he was correct and the courts agreed with him and the industry had to change their vernacular to personal flotation device. And so that's where we get the term PFD. There are different types of PFDs. I won't bore you with uh, all the different types. You can read them here. <clears throat> the type 3 is what most people will see. They're very good. They're very comfortable. If you spend a little bit of money, we used to have a thing called a horse collar. This type 2 up here <clears throat> at some... Uh, canoe liveries, you would see these, absolutely horrible. Very, very uncomfortable to wear. Nobody wore them. If the PFD is not worn, it is not effective. And so this Type 3 over here is what we see on the market uh, most of the time now. There is a inverse relationship between the amount of money you spend and the comfort level of that PFD. If you're spending $100 for a PFD, it's going to be pretty comfortable. And the key to comfort is the number of adjustments on a PFD. This one right here <clears throat> has shoulder strap adjustments up here, side adjustments here, and we can't see them on this one, but there's probably one or two adjustments down here on the side. Sometimes you'll have a belt and a buckle right here that can be used to adjust so you can get very much of a custom fit in a type 3 PFD. Again, generally speaking, the more money you spend, the more comfortable it's going to be. So here's some websites that you can you can visit. Um, <clears throat> not very uh, pleasant reading, but it does illustrate that accidents do happen on the water, and PFDs are, are just an absolute tremendous uh, safety device if they are used. And in my my demo, I'll show the proper use. 
So you're recording the person breaking the law. Now, you had better be darn sure that you are not breaking the law. Remember, you have to have permission to fish on private property. And uh, most of these videos I see on YouTube involve housing developments where somebody has gone in, they've bought 20 acres, and they've put, you know, 50 houses in there. And they've built retention ponds that also function as a, as a water feature. And usually there's a, a covenants involved. <clears throat> a covenant is a law that is allowed for very, very, very specific use. And so in the homeowners association, governing that development, there are rules. And those rules very often supersede what we would consider public land. And so if that lake is within that development, that lake is considered private property. And I see a lot of these YouTubers basically trespassing, thinking that they are in the right, <clears throat> when in fact they, they are, are illegally trespassing. So know where you're going, know the rules. If you're out on, um, on, a, on a, you know, Lake, Lake, Lake Monroe, Lake Griffey, and somebody is, you know, hassling you, that is illegal. Um, call the conservation officer. In fact, any law enforcement officer, city police, county sheriff, is responsible for enforcing these laws. This is not some special little, you know, um, rule that's buried within the, the, the uh, fish and wildlife regulations. No, this is part of, of, of the general code. So just understand that you do have rights and People cannot prevent or hinder you from the lawful taking of fish and game. Just make sure that you are lawful. And uh, Section 3 down here uh, talks about um, following the orders of a law enforcement officer, which <clears throat> could also kind of uh, potentially get you in trouble. So anyway, there you go. Um, that pretty much wraps up safety for Unit 3. I hope you found this informative. I hope you found this useful. Again, questions, comments down below. And I think the final thing that I would like to pass on to you is to remember, the further from the road you go, the more you have to know. So with that, we will conclude Unit 3. Everyone have a wonderful fishing day.